this is mostly work of my students, Yang Chi and Ke Yu, two of my three wonderful students who will be uh, seeking employment next year. This is a side project for all of us. And um, what's interesting about this is, well, what to me is most interesting is, is the way it connects several different topics. So uh, I'll begin uh, telling you about tensors. So I've been going outside my comfort zone the past few years, uh, talking to people like engineers and statisticians, and it's, it's very sort of harrowing and scary at first, but it has its rewards, and uh, I, I would encourage you to do it once in a while. I and mean, just, e even if you decide you're never going to talk to those people again, it's still, I think, worth, worthwhile. And the, the talk, the topic, the particular topic of the talk starts out in quantum mechanics, uh, but I'm going to review a little bit of linear algebra before then because it's about tensors. Uh, all of us, I mean, we've been seeing tensors every single talk today, pretty much, and the representation theory associated. But I just want to review it nonetheless um, because we're going to start from the beginning. Right, I, maybe I sit over, stand over here because this thing might like me better if I'm closer to it. Right, so before I even review tensors, I'm going to review, um, before multilinear algebra, let's review linear algebra. Right? So uh, if you have a pair of vector spaces, something in their tensor product, you can look at it a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, linear map from the dual of one to the other, or the other way around. And um, you say the map is of rank one if uh, there's a vector in your first space, vector in your second space, that it's the tensor product of these two, where this tensor product is just so this map uh, alpha goes to alpha eats v. So alpha is something that eats something in V1 and spits out a number. So alpha eats V, spits out some number, and the answer is that number multiplied by W. Uh, in general, if you have an element of higher rank, uh, all the rank is defined to be the smallest number R, such that there's R in elements in V1, R elements in V2, such that T is the sum of those rank one elements. Right? Everybody knows this? And, um, Actually, already, this simple thing, this showed up in several talks when the, the condition, certain curvature conditions, uh, turned out to be that the, the, the curvature was of low rank. Um, it may be in a slightly more generalized setting than this, but we'll get to that later. Now, the fundamental theorem, what people call the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, is that this definition of rank coincides with the dimension of the image of F looked at one way as a linear map. Ooh, f is equal to t. That's my first typo. Um, f equals t. Uh, looked at the image one way, or you look at the image other way. It does not matter. You always get the same answer. And in particular, not moreover, but in particular, the, the rank is absolutely bounded by the minimum of the two dimensions. And for generic, you get equality. And finally, uh, if you have a sequence of linear maps of rank r, converging to some limiting linear map, then that, that linear map in the limit has rank at most r. The rank is semi-continuous. Everybody good with that? Linear algebra? All right, we move on. Uh, oh, we still stay in linear algebra just a little bit more. Um, we're interested in representation theory, especially you know, uh, group actions on spaces of curvature tensors and the like. And um, here, the representation theory is very simple. There's only um, a dimension, say V1 is smaller than V2, dimension V1 possibilities up to um, change of basis. And so let's let uh, sigma r be the, the set of elements of rank at most r. Uh, oops, I wanted to say one more fact about that. And as you know, that's just the zero set of the r plus 1 by r plus 1 minor. So it's an algebraic variety. It's homo you know, quasi homogeneous. Well, anyway, we know everything. We think we know everything there is to know about that. So let's move on. Uh, right, now we have a bunch of vector spaces. Uh, we have a tensor inside. And again, you have this linear map interpretation. You move one out and map it to the others, and the, just as before. And it's rank one if there's a, you know, one vector in each space that is the tensor product, where when we use this linear map interpretation, you know, v1 will eat 
say we do this T1, V1 elite alpha, and what spits out is some scalar times the tensor product of the rest. OK? Let's move on. Right, so the rank, again, is the smallest r, such that you can write it as a sum. I think I did two things at once, but that's OK. I, I'm not used to this clicker thingy. Um, right, so the smallest r, such that you can write it as a sum of r rank 1 tensors. And uh, the, the big news is that the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, which we took for granted, is absolutely false for tensors every single assertion is false. So in particular, if you start out with a generic tensor, then its rank is, is roughly, you know, if these are all of dimension uh, capital M, it's M to the N uh, minus 1, roughly, which is a whole lot more than the dimension of each of these. So there's no hope that these definitions can coincide. And what's um, also disturbing, actually, especially to people in applications, they really don't like this last line, rank can jump up or down when you take limits. So uh, what do we do as mathematicians when we have this problem? Well, we, we take the closure, right? We, we include the limit point. Um, this is uh, sigma r. I still use the same notation, independent of the number of vector spaces. But if I need to remember how many there are, I write it down. And um, this is called the uh, cone over the r secant variety, the Segre variety, if you like that kind of thing. OK? So, uh, and this is, is it, because we take closure, this is uh, the things of border rank at most R is the terminology people use. But unlike, unlike in the linear algebra situation, in the linear algebra situation, this was basically everything. If you knew which, which of these objects you lived on, you knew everything there was to know about your tensor. Here, it's completely different. The orbit structure inside here is wild. And we have no idea of, of what's out there uh, in general. So in particular, we had, this, we had these three definitions of rank that coincided for linear maps. And here we know they don't coincide. So let's define some additional uh, varieties inside spaces. Oh, I forgot to, uh, I wrote it. See, this is really um, not my forte, this Beamer thing. So anyway, um, yeah, this is what I just said. Uh, and let's. So let's go back to that old definition where we looked at the linear map in each direction and f, oh, yeah, this f is, is supposed to be a t. So anytime you see an f that looks like it shouldn't be an f, it's a t. Uh, but these f's are supposed to be f's, bold f's, for small, smaller dimensions than the bold v's. And uh, so when you bound what they call the multilinear rank, you get a new geometric object which is controlling something else. Okay? And uh, these are the two most studied things. The good thing is this one is quite easy to study. It's just like the matrices of rank at most R, because that's really what it is, just forgetting various tensor product structures. This one, um, almost nothing that you want to know is known about it other than its dimension. And it's not even known in complete generality what the dimensions are. You just have a, what you would expect. OK, so these are two typical uh, G varieties, where G is the product of the general linear groups that show up. But as I said, there are many others. Any questions? No. OK, so we're going to need another today, because uh, we're going to start going back to quantum mechanics. And so, all right, so I'm going to simplify. We only have a short time together, so this is not an honest course in quantum mechanics. But basically, um, you, you have a Hilbert space uh, that's supposed to be uh, your universe. And the, your physical, where, wherever your physical system is in a given moment, uh, that's some point in the Hilbert space. And um, this Hilbert space, if you think of your uh, quantum mechanical system as being a bunch of molecules glued together, or even a, an atom consisting of protons and electrons, the scale doesn't really matter. You, you think of each of these individual systems, like a molecule or a proton, depending what scale you're on, as having its own Hilbert space. And the big space is just tensor product of your smaller spaces. OK? So, um, so somehow you have, now let's just do a thought experiment, right? Say we have a, 
a lattice, right, um, where we have, say, 10,000 or 100,000 molecules, even if we're only looking at spin up or spin down, we got 2 to the 10,000, 2 to the 100,000, we have a mighty big space to do calculations in. <coughs> now, in, class, in the classical world, oh, see, I, yeah, this is really, right, so in the classical world, right, if we did not allow what they call entanglement, if things behaved as if in classical mechanics, the only things that would show up are the rank one elements in here. That's the classical world. So you could do your calculations in Hilbert space and just do classical mechanics if you restrict yourself to rank one tensors. And all this kind of quantum phenomena has to do with the fact that you get tensors inside here which describe physical systems, that you get this inter interaction at a distance, right? We, you know, we all know, well, maybe we don't all know about that, but I'm going to pretend we do. Um, and so the rank one tensors, though, it's just a tiny itty bitty corner. Again, if this is you know, 2 to the n, this is just 2 times n. That's a much smaller number. Yeah. So one of the things I learned uh, with uh, talking to computer scientists is that you know, for me, anything over, I don't know, 100 or something was a big number, right? But, but that's not, there's bigger numbers like on scale, right? And so, so 10 to the factorial. Is, is, is sort of one big number, because that's when my computer poops out at 10 to the factorial. But then there's other sort of big numbers that, you know, everybody's computer poops out after a certain thing too, right? And all right, anyway. Uh, so, but in, 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 even in quantum mechanical world, you don't float around here because the entanglement, you know, me, molecule here, may be, you know, influencing what's going on in this molecule nearby, but a molecule across the room is highly, you know, probability zero of, of having any entanglement with me whatsoever. So the idea is to come up with some, some sub-variety of this space that, say, say, each of us is molecules in some system, right? And, and we're, you know, so maybe I can influence Robin's world, but, you know, by the time we get to the back of the room, Andy, it's unlikely to be, to be touched by me, right? So, so somehow we want to allow local entanglement, right? So, so the tensors between Robin and I can have high rank, but, but as far as Andy's concerned, it should be like as if we were in the classical world, right? So that's the idea, is to come up with something sitting inside here that's a lot smaller than this thing that represents things that are feasible. OK, so let's do so. I'm not very good at drawing. I should have at least put, you know, four by four grid, but you'll have to imagine that this is really like 10,000 by 10,000 grid to make this picture meaningful. Um, so let's say we're all stuck on some, some lattice, some crystals or something, molecules in a crystal, and we're arranged in some nice regular pattern. And um, so the one here is likely to be entangled with its nearest neighbors, but not something far away, right? So we want to come up with a subset of the set of tens of all of all of Hilbert space that models this. That's the goal. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we we need to come up with some auxiliary construction that's going to enable us. So imagine we have a vector space attached to each of these molecules, and then we want sort of this this some entanglement to be allowed here, but not between this one and this one. Right? That's the idea. Okay. So let's draw a picture of who we're going to allow to you know, dance with who. And um, there we go. So now I have to use this picture, or whatever configuration I have, to come up with a sub-variety of, um, say, C2 tensor to the ninth in this case. And it should be something small that we could work with, physically reasonable and relatively small. Right? Because, and, and actually, the physicists have heuristic arguments that you cannot even theoretically have high levels, arbitrarily high levels of entanglement. But I don't understand those arguments, so I'm not going to share my ignorance with you. Right, so there we are. Everybody understand the goal? OK. Well, some people are nodding. But nobody's nodded off yet. I'm very proud of you all. This is a really rough time of day. And if I weren't lecturing, I would be nodding off. So here's what we do. So we have that graph, um, has edges and vertices. 
to each um, vertex, I already told you what to do. We're going to take whatever Hilbert space is associated to that molecule. And then, um, yeah, and that's just notation. And then uh, inside, oh, I'm going to forget about the inner product structure on the Hilbert space, because it doesn't matter for this lecture. Um, it's a GL affair, not a um, SU affair. So um, right, so we have this graph. We have vertices. We have the edges. And now to each edge, I'm going to attach a number. So to edge 1, I attach a number boldy 1. To edge 2, boldy 2. And the size of these numbers is going to tell me, so let's say edge 1 connects molecule 1 to molecule 2. Um, the size of E1 is going to control, well, if E1 is equal to 1, they're not going to be allowed to be entangled at all. And the larger E1 is, the more entanglement I'm going to permit. Okay? So, so this vector here, so first of all, the graph structure tells me who's allowed to dance with who. And this is telling you sort of how close you're allowed to get. So, you know, if, if e, EJ is, is, you know, some big number, they're doing lampada or whatever. Right, so um, I think I already said all of this. Right, oh, we got to make a directed graph because we're going to do contractions of tensors, but that just doesn't really matter. Right, so here's the definition. Uh, it's going to be a little hard to parse, so I'm going to do an example, then go back to it. So we're looking at all tensors in our big vector space that come from taking a little tensor, a bunch of little tensors, one for each vertex, and we have. So if it were a classical thing, we just have a vector in the vertex, and we take the tensor product of the vertices. But instead, I allow this little bit of um, to neighbors, some interaction with the neighbors. And again, the size of these vector spaces is going to tell me how much. And then, since I have the vector spaces and the duals are lined up, I can contract, get rid of that auxiliary thing to get back into my original space. Right. And I think this is already something I said as well. OK, so let's do an example. Then I'll go back to the definition. Your question. Questions are welcome. <laughs> OK, so let's take a very simple system. So think of V1, V2, and V3 as some big vector spaces. We only have three molecules. And V1, as far as its world is concerned, it's going to interact with V2. But V3 is too far away. V2 is in the middle. It's going to interact with both V1 and V3. Right? It's going to be entangled with both V1 and V3. Possibly. We're going to allow it. So let's just, let, let's just turn on a little bit of juice, allow a little bit of entanglement here, a little bit here. Two. That's the smallest you could have to have something non-trivial. And let's just take a bunch of, say, independent vectors in each vector space. So uh, our first big tensor associated to this vertex is going to be in um, the vector space associated to the first edge and the vector space associated to this first um, molecule. So it's a tensor product of two vector spaces. And I'm allowed anything in there. But notice that since this number is small, at most two vectors from my first vector space are going to show up. My second molecule, this one can really sort of mess with everybody. and um, so <coughs> it's allowed um, an arbitrary element, an element here and an element here. So really, think of the tensor product of these as a C4. So I have four vectors. Ah, that one is a 2. That second one is a 2. Um, that, that can show up here. And then the third is basically the same as the first. And then when I tensor it all together, I get some mess, and then I contract. And I get something that looks like this. So only two vectors from here are showing up. And as far as it's concerned, these two things could just be one molecule, right? I mean, it's not, it doesn't even notice that this is separate from this. And so it's this with, with, with this one, so this with some, some complicated thing, and then this u2 with some other complicated thing, right? I should have put parentheses. So from the perspective of this thing, it's allowed sort of um, two dimensions worth of entanglement. But look at what happens to our middle one. Our middle vector space has four vectors showing up. And so it's, it has quite a bit of entanglement going on. So 
there's a completely elementary geometric description here that um, this is uh, something we've seen before in this talk in disguise, namely just the rank two things where I forget that this is uh, two different vector spaces, and I just think of it as one big vector space, tensored together, V2 tensored V3, and I'm allowed up to rank two here, and similarly on the other side. Okay, let's go back to the definition just to make sure. I yeah, right. So again, we have for each vertex, we, this is our total Hilbert space, and we're only going to allow ourselves to occupy things that we get by sort of these auxiliary constructions and contraction. Right? Should I think of this as a, is this a linear space or just some? So this is a vector space. This tensor network states. Is, will be a linear space. It is not. not a space. Yes. And in fact, now we get to the, the, the subject of the talk. So in, even in this one, you see it's not linear. It's the intersection of two algebraic varieties. Right? Uh, right. So uh, the purpose of this talk is what kind of sets are these? That's the purpose of this talk, is to explain to you. And we have a fairly satisfactory answer of what what these things look like. Right. So let me tell you, I, so in, in speaking to people in the outside world, not only did I speak with uh, computer scientists and engineers and statisticians, but I've also spoke with a physicist. So that's like a little closer to home, right? We kind of speak the same language. And in particular, he was aware that something, you know, there's something to check with this definition. Namely, if we have a convergent sequence of tensors, that um, each of them for time non-zero lies in one of the is one of these tensor network states, is the limit also a tensor network state? That was his question. That is, is this thing Zariski closed? And he's it, you know, being a physicist and sort of close closer to us than most most of these other folks, um, he not only knew how to ask the question, but he answered it uh, at least if you had a, uh, a, a chain or a tree. But already for triangles, uh, he didn't know. And I should say, in, in the physics literature, uh, the tensor network states that show up the most is exactly these large loops. So I, 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 didn't, I forgot to make the slide. So you have some big loop. Yeah, I should put some dot, dot, dots. Because if, if you have a molecule to the outside world, if I'm standing over here and I want to know the physics of this, Really, the boundary, the geometry of the boundary is what's governing the physics. So even though there's all kind of stuff going on in the interior, they ignore it. And since they ignore it, I'm going to ignore it too. But it, it doesn't matter for the geometry of the talk. Right? Oh, so, so let's do the first case that's not a tree, a triangle. I feel much better writing on the board, Andy. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm from Stone Age. What can I say? Right, so let's do triangle. So we have V1, V2, V3, E1, E2, E3. That's, that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit. Oh, but that's not what we're going to talk about because, because um, right, the, as I began this talk, I told you uh, the reason this is, I find this quite exciting. The, the theorem, to be honest, is not super deep, but it's, it's good because it answers the question of some physicists. And there, I actually, you know, you never know when you meet someone on the street whether they're just telling you something's important or, or you know, making, you know, whether it's really something important or it's just something that they and no one else cares about. So I looked up these tensor network states, and there's like a lot, a lot of preprints on them. So I don't know whether. <laughs> physicists actually care about his question, but they certainly care about these things, and they're using them left and right, especially the large loops. Right, but I'm not going to talk about that for a minute. I'm going to take a complete detour. Uh, I was go, you know, I'm always tempted to talk about uh, this geometric complexity theory, but I've been, you know, some of you have heard me lecture quite a bit on it, so I thought I should talk on something else, but I couldn't resist at least five minutes of it. So there's this um, you know, famous P versus NP problem. So the traveling salesman, uh, you can't find a pa fast path for him. That's the conjecture. 
Uh, and uh, Valiant uh, translated this to a problem, sort of uh, algebra. Um, namely, we take our favorite polynomial, the determinant, and um, we want to realize it, realize a permanent. So that's the permanent is you take the determinant and you just put all plus signs in. So it counts perfect matchings on bipartite graphs. So it's sort of NP complete or whatever in some some, it's, 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 it's one of those hard things to do. And the determinant is one of those easy things to do. And the idea is to take something hard and convert it to something easy. And the conjecture is you should not be able to do that. You should have a heavy price to pay. Namely, if you take a permanent in M, where M is a small number of variables, and you want to realize it in terms of a big determinant by setting a bunch of entries to 0 or plus or minus 1 or, you know, in a your variables with signs, you cannot do it unless n is huge compared to m asymptotically. That's the conjecture. Uh, you prove this, you get fame, fortune, a million dollars, stuff like that. You know. If the conjecture is true, then he's not equal to n. That's the, yeah, everybody's betting heavily that they're not equal. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who, who's betting the other way in public. I, I have no bet, personally. I'd be happy. Anyway, so, but, so this is a little bit geometry, but there's, there's kind of an annoyance here because it's still a little bit in coordinates. So Mamouli and Sahoni, they have a very nice idea. They said, well, let's get rid of the coordinates. And you just take the GLN squared orbit closure. So your GLN, think squared, that's your change of variables. And then you take the orbit closure. That's going to at least allow you the endomorphisms. Um, one thing they didn't know uh, was if you take, is, is this set any bigger than this set? They didn't know that. Uh, that question was answered quite recently. Um, and uh, there is something new in the closure. Actually, this talk would be a lot more exciting if this question was still open, but it's been answered. But anyway, right. So that's a hard question, or at least people think it's really hard. And they don't think it's going to get solved in our lifetime. And so what do we do as mathematicians when we have a problem that we think is too hard to solve? We look for an easier one that we think we can solve. And so, so Bergeiser and Ickenmeyer, uh, who are in complexity theory, said, well, that's too hard. Uh, let's try working with something easier first. Let's study um, matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication, it eats a p by q matrix, eats a q by r matrix, and spits out a p by r matrix. And um, so you could think of it as a tensor uh, inside this triple tensor product. OK, so we're getting back to tensors. The, the whole, everything will come together by the end of the talk if I don't run out of time, speaking of which. Oh, everything is good. Right. So, um, so what Bergeiser and Ickemeyer proposed to study was the orbit closure of matrix multiplication. So we have a particular point inside this space. We allow ourselves all changes of coordinates and closure of that. And so the idea is to, well, find equations and study the boundary, right? The interior is just relabeling a matrix multiplication, what occurs on the boundary. Yes, that's what the slide even asks. Right. Um, so note that linear projections, if we throw away some of our variables, that's certainly on the boundary, right? Because you can do that. So whatever um, this thing is, it certainly contains linear projections, right? Just like uh, the valiant, the mamoli sahoni variety is contained in the valiant uh, set. Right. Right. Is there anything else? That's the question. Um, Right, so now, uh, right, now we go back to um, bring things together. So uh, the first observation is that the set of tensor network states is the analog of the valiant set for matrix multiplication. And for large loops, you get matrix multiplication of however many uh, molecules are in your loop. So the, this thing that Lars Gross, uh, do any of you speak Dutch? Yes, how do you pronounce his name? Grossedijk, the guy who asked the question. Grossedijk. Yeah. yeah Grossedijk, yes. Yeah, I just call him Lars, so I don't know. <laughs> Which is probably also not pronounced correctly. But anyway, he's not here today, so at, at most one of you is going to be outraged at my mispronunciation. Um, right, so this thing, 
we identify it geometrically completely as this, um, this valiant thing, this, this endomorphisms hitting matrix multiplication. So in that sense, uh, the part of the toy, so the toy geometric complexity theory question is the same question, essentially. I, of course, uh, the Bergeiser question is a little bit more ambitious. They don't, but the first part of the question is, is there something else in the boundary other than this? And my students answer this. The answer is yes. It's not the risky close. Questions? So note, uh, so there's a fairly satisfactory description. You know, we, we have a, a complete description of this uh, original object. And then we also answered the original question, is this thing closed? It's not. So I got a proof for you. I, I mean, I should do at least some kind of something resembling a proof in the talk, right? So let's prove it. So what, we, what do we need to do? We need to find a curve in this space that limits to something, but that something is not in this space. Curve in set, I should say. Right. So now let's remind ourselves what matrix multiplication is. Uh, well, let's, let's be you know, sort of a little bit more symmetrical and think of it as eating three matrices and taking the trace of their triple of their, of their product, right? Why not? That's, that's a little bit nicer. And so the action of the group is just acting on the matrices uh, by the inverse elements before, uh, before taking this triple trace, right? So we need a, we now I need three curves, one in each space. Uh, they could be stationary, but that's not going to work for you. Uh, uh, such that for t not equal to 0, everything is fine. And in the limit, you get something that's not in this set. So here's the answer. Um, so the, the thing you do is you start with projection operator. Um, and then you add on something to make it invertible. And then so the first two are going to be the same projection operator. So I take any blocking that looks like this. It, it, it could be rectangular blocking. It doesn't matter. Just off diagonal and diagonal. Um, and then um, so this first one is I just take my matrices and I just project down and I get rid of the off diagonal stuff. And here I, for the third one, I break symmetry a little. I take it and I just have the diagonal. And if you take the trace of a matrix like this times another matrix like this times a matrix like that, well, it's going to be trace zero. So you get zero. So that's the thing you need. And then you have to rescale so that you, um, in the limit, you don't get zero, but you know, just when we do calculus, you dig zero over zero, so everything comes out to some kind of nice limit. And if you do that right, you get this. So you get a sum of things. Well, now to complete the proof, I need to show you two things. I need to show you, one, that this is not in the interior, and two, that it's not a projection. So. Uh, so to show it's not in the interior, you, you compute the stabilizer of this, th of this um, limiting operator. And you find it's larger than the stabilizer of matrix multiplication. So it cannot be in the interior. It cannot be just a relabeling of matrix multiplication. On the other hand, we have to go back to this subspace variety I introduced at the beginning of the talk. And I said everything is known about that. And what's that variety? That's the variety of tensors where you don't use all your variables. And so we have equations to test. If we have a tensor in hand, we, you know, so some of you didn't like us could have disguised it and made it look like we're using all the variables. But it's really not. So you have to actually test with those polynomials we did. And it's not in a subspace variety, so it uses all the variables. That's the, that's the proof. Now, <clears throat> I should say, so you're never supposed to sort of completely solve a problem, right? Because then nobody cares about it. So the, the most interesting work has yet to be done um, because there's the, the limit points that we found uh, have a stabilizer that's significantly larger than that of matrix multiplication, even if you take sort of the most symmetrical blocking. 
And um, on the other hand, the components of the boundary should have co-dimension one. So there should be uh, deformations of matrix multiplication where the dimension of the stabilizer only goes up by one. And we don't know how to find those. So, so there's, there's a nice project. Uh, you could get it. Yeah, Dennis. Uh, so each of these Vs secretly is a tensor product of two vector spaces. So say this is A star tensor B, this is B star tensor C, and this is um, A tensor C star, right? And so then you have the change of bases in A, B, and C. <coughs> so if it's PQR, you have GLP cross GLQ cross GLR, is the stabilizer inside GLPQ cross GLPR cross GLQR. So, so the, the group, yeah, so you have sort of PQ squared plus QR squared plus, as opposed to just P squared plus Q squared plus R squared. So that tells you the dimension of this variety, which I think I wrote down already. So this, is, this, is, this would be very interesting to, to pursue. Oh, oh yeah, great, I'm still on time. Uh, so um, let me uh, tell you that we have a fairly satisfactory description of these things in general. And so, so there's this, <clears throat> so if your vector spaces are too big or too small, uh, then we're going to reduce to the size when they're just right. Namely, um, if, if you, so if you remember our earlier example, I, I'm scared to go all the way back to it, but well, I guess I could try, right? Uh, I should not have tried. Oh, this was a big mistake. Ah, here, right. So here, for example, I use two vectors in this space, four vectors in this, and two vectors in that. Yeah? So what's the physical meaning of the tensor Gs? No, they're just there. No, they're just placeholders. It's, it's not the vectors E, but it's the dimension of this vector space tells me how much I'm entanglement between particles I'm allowing in myself. So, so as far as I can tell, they usually take these things to be two-dimensional because they don't want things to be too tied up. But I mean the tensor Gs that you're either formalized before you subtract the Q1, Q2, Q3. Right, these are just placeholders. See, this is an element of a vector space, this is an element of the dual space, and so I'm going to glue these together. They're going to wash out, they disappear. So those, that's just an auxiliary space that allows me to entangle the things here with the things over here. But they must be specifying, I mean, what information do they encode? They encode, the, the dimension of this vector space encodes how much entanglement is permissible between this thing and this you know, stuff over here. No, these are vectors. The E's are vectors. The, these E's are vectors, right? So, so they, they, they go away. They're not, they, yeah. Imagine you've only got E1 and E1, you've only got four of them, right? It's sort of like saying there's not entanglement far away. Yeah, and over here, you know, there's, there's going to be the same number of E's for this little V1 in the corner, even though the whole space is huge, right? So, so locally, this is sort of the picture on this gigantic thing. I guess right. the question is, how, how, how does the vector space describe an entanglement? No, it's the dimension of the vector space. If the dimension of the vector space is 1. But why doesn't he just assign a number? He assign the no, because we're, th we're not fixing a given system. We're fixing a set of admissible states. And so as we run over all possible vectors in all these vector spaces, that would run over all possible feasible states. But we want to study not a particular state at a given moment, but we want to study all possible states a given system could be in. And these vectors govern it. But these things wash out. The, the, these E's just, they go away. So it's really the dimension of that vector space that's controlling the permissible entanglement, and that's the thing to focus on. And the structure of the graph says who gets to entangle with who. Okay, now I have to do another. I think if I do this, it goes faster, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> too fast. Uh, oh, okay. Right. 
So like I said, um, if it's just right, you know, if, if we use up all the v's for our most generic state, <coughs> so that's that the v, the dimension of my vector space here associated to my molecule is equal to the product of everything near it. So, um, so in physics, this is not what happens. In physics, this, this one is much smaller, and I'm going to tell you how to deal with that. But first, let's deal with when we have equality. That, that's called critical, and otherwise it's subcritical or supercritical, right? And so subcritical is not really so interesting because that's not what's going to happen in quantum mechanics. So, um, but nonetheless, we described it more or less. They're just projections of the critical case. Um, the supercritical, though, is really physically what ends up happening, uh, that these, these vector spaces are smaller than the, the, the than are bigger. The dimensions of these vector spaces are bigger than, than the things they can be entangled with. Right? Otherwise, you would just collapse the system. Right. So, um, so we have uh, propositions that if you, these are local propositions that you can sort of get rid of uh, reduced to the critical case. Now, the, this, the first one is not very interesting at all. It's just projection. The second one, though, something sort of nice shows up. So since I am not yet out of time, I'll at least mention this, because it is a general technique that one uses when studying spaces of tensors. And I'm advertising this, this, this book that's coming out, so it's going to have all kinds of cool stuff like that, not just for physics, but you know, any, anything you like. Also, also Ramanian geometry, right? I mean, we want to study curvature tensors that uh, are decomposable elements of the appropriate module. They're, they're in there too, but I didn't need to put that in the title because I knew any you know, respectable geometer, they see the word tensors and geometry, they're, they're sold already. But these other folks, you know, they would. Uh, anyway, let's move on. So, so recall this, uh, these, these uh, tensors that don't use all the variables. So they actually sit inside some tensor product. Ah, another typo. Yeah. No, it's OK. So the actual tensor sits inside the tensor product of a bunch of smaller vector spaces where um, these, these Fs are the sort of multi-dimensions. So, so you, basically, you're not using all of your space up. And uh, so there's a nice, uh, this thing is almost homogeneous and uh, has been studied quite a bit by algebraic geometers uh, because it's a prototype of something called a kemp weimann desingularization. It, it's a prototype of a G variety describable via a kemp weimann uh, collapsing of a homogeneous vector bundle. So this thing is not homogeneous, but it's describable essentially as the total space of a vector bundle over a homogeneous variety. That's actually a desingularization of it. So let me, uh, oh, I got to zoom now. OK, so we have Grossmannian. We have tautological subspace bundle. Um, we take tensor product of tautological subspace bundles over Grossmannian. This projects down to our original space. And um, the image of this bundle is, is exactly this variety. So we have a homogeneous bundle over a homogeneous variety. Here, we, if you believe bott borel Vey theorem and, and uh, maybe uh, know something about spectral sequences, you could compute all the cohomology here you want. You can compute minimal free resolution. It's all been done in this particular case. Everything is understood. And the theorem of Kempf and Weimann is you can translate all your knowledge of everything here down to here, even though this is sort of crushing this thing uh, down a little bit. It's a, this, the, the total space here is a desingularization of that. And so, uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, so the geometry of these uh, supercritical cases is that um, you can realize them as a tower of bundles, or, or rather the image of a tower of bundles over uh, the original one for the subspace variety. And I have to stop. I have to stop. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I can, yeah, that's not a question I'll answer right now, but I can tell you what the permanent is very nice. I, I, I used to think it was really stupid, but now, actually, you'll like it even better because it deals with vial groups. So permanent is about vial groups. So.
But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Because I have to use some language that not everybody here would like. Okay, I'll ditch the mic. We can talk about it now. 